This is what I've discovered the engine, I think, for my entire journey has been, has been this level of relentless, like, insatiable curiosity. And I think that that curiosity is really what saved me, because I began to get curious about the mind. I began to get curious about the fact that as you learned more, and as you looked inward and reflected, that your consciousness, the texture of your consciousness, would shift and change so slightly. And whenever that happens, then the way that you perceive the world changes. And whenever that happens, then the way that you change in the world. And I noticed that on a very granular level from a young age. And I think it made me, obviously, the, the curiosity of wanting to know more and more and dig deeper, but I think it made me uh, grateful to know that even though I was you know, suffering, that there was a path forward, there was a way out. Sacred Sons Podcast is proudly sponsored by Four Visions. We are blessed to do this unboxing. Thank you to Mariah. To me, it's really the mission of Four Visions, how they give back to the indigenous. You know what I love about Four Visions? Their packaging is next level. Ooh. CBD pain cell. We got that Four Visions Radiant Protector Kit for the fathers. Botanicals, looks like some Shondur lotion, some protection spray for courage and strength. Wild harvested Himalayan Sheila G. Ooh. This little package has so many nutrients in it. We can always use a bit more self-care, invest in ourselves. And Four Visions has these earth-based products. These methods are proven by 5,000 years of indigenous practices. For men, come back into natural ways of health and wellness. I think it's super important. Palo Santo anointing oil. The sweet bath in the bitter bath. All organic ingredients. Sweet basil, tulsi, rosemary, thyme, lavender. You know what I absolutely love about Four Visions is that they use 100% natural material for their clothing, so I feel safe and confident and happy wearing it. A portion of the proceeds of the merch goes to Magic Fund's Music Roots Recovery Project for indigenous youth in Puto Mayo, Colombia. And they're literally bringing the indigenous traditions back to the youth through the music, through the songs, and through the traditions. It's a beautiful place to invest in. Love the mission and how much they're giving back to these indigenous cultures in Colombia and South America. It really is the difference I think we need. Peace family, Adam Jackson here with another episode of the Sacred Sons podcast. Brothers and sisters, mindfulness, what is it? How do we utilize it? How can we get more of it? We're going to explore that today with our guest, Corey Allen. Grateful for you, Corey, for showing up here as we are one day away from the release of your new book, Brave New You. How are you feeling on the precipice of releasing this book? I'm feeling well, man. Thank you for the introduction. You know, I'm feeling good. I'm I'm mainly just excited to get it into people's hands, you know, because I know how much is in there in terms of tools and things that people can really use in their life and new ways of thinking about a lot of the common things that we face. And so the idea of of getting that out there and having it actually start doing the work that I want it to do and I hope it will do is really what excites me the most, man. So I'm just ready for that, ready for the words to funnel into my balls and, you know, things that start happening out there. Yeah, beautiful. So with that, let's let's talk about those tools that that help us to tap into our authentic voice, that help us to be our best selves with that. Corey Allen, he is an author, he's a podcast host, and again, his new book, Brave New You, is out in the world now. Please welcome Corey Allen. Hey, man, thank you so much for having me here. Yes, sir. Summer is here. I'm in San Diego. I spent the whole weekend in the beach with my kids and like out in the sunshine. You're in Austin, Texas. How are you feeling over there in Austin, brother? Like a jellyfish, man, that's been (laughs) in the sun. You know, you see one that looks like a giant potato chip that's been on like washed up and just been totally dehydrated. Yeah, that's (laughs) that's about it. Yeah, it's it's hot and toasty, man. It's steamy here. So, you know. You know, and with that, I, I find the heat of summer. And especially this, you know, we're four years out of that heated summer of 2020. 
Remember that? We're four oh, yeah. years. And I, and I feel like there's a cyclical collective trauma that we all went through, through the unknown of COVID, through the racial tension, through the riots, all of those things four years ago. And with this heat coming up, I'm feeling the shadows are still bubbling to the surface. Are you experience, experiencing that in your world? Hmm, that's interesting. I mean, you know, there's always shadows bubbling to the surface. I think what I've been experiencing a lot is um, a really immense level of what I would call it like existential gratitude. Hmm. Um, and I was just speaking with a friend of mine, uh, and she brought up the same thing, which I thought was interesting. And I don't know if it's something that's, you know, in the air or if it's something that I've done, a, you know, one to three podcasts a day for the last month. And so having a different person ask you questions about yourself for hours every day for a long time <laughs> is like, it's a very unusual form of self inquiry, you know, because <laughs> like my meta mind is always observing what's happening, you know, in my conscious mind. So while I'm having these conversations, I'm also reflecting at the same time. And, you know, um, I think that that could be it, some of it as well. But I've been feeling, yeah, just a, a gratitude on a a foundational level that is just the fact that I am, you know, conscious and awake and aware in this moment of time, in this form, is uh, really been quite moving and beautiful to me. And I, I felt like that a lot over the last month. Beautiful. I love this, that that term existential gratitude i've been feeling that for my family i just uh, coming out of the beach day yesterday and kids and roasting marshmallows in the backyard like really in the summer elements and i guess speaking to like the the mindfulness and in the the meta observer i'm watching my children make memories Ah, oh, beautiful. I'm, 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 I'm an active participant in my children's memories. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So I'm, I'm like watching how how I can have impact, whether that's positive or negative, because that's a reality. Mm -hmm. But also just watching watching how the beauty of life continues to unfold no matter what's happening outside. You know, there's still so much to be grateful for. In, in my world, I have four children. Family for me right now, is it's everything. It's everything, and it's where I, I'm putting my most um, intention into, I would say. You are a daily meditator of 25 years. What are you grateful for? What, what is that gratitude for specifically? It's just from, I suppose, the chance of awareness. I mean, like it's really like when I mentioned it being on a foundational level, it's the fact that I'm here at all. The fact that I am like, get to experience just being alive has been really really and, and I know it's, it probably sounds like so it, it's very apparent um but i think that like we're all like most of us are grateful for the fact that we're here um but it's been arising in in a lot like a lot more gentle and a lot more fine type of way for me that i'm not n normally used to um i typically have like internally i have this sort of gardening with dynamite mentality about a lot of like about thoughts and ideas and things like that i know externally i come off very gentle you know um but internally i have that sort of engine running um and so i think maybe some of the softening of that is maybe what i'm experiencing and it's just like the wow of now man <laughs> the wow of now yeah yeah, absolutely. Was there a time for you in your life that you were not grateful to be alive? Was there a, was there a time for you where you were like, what was it like for you to go from, let's say, unconscious to being having awareness and to being reawakened? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, this is another thing that's come up for me that I think has been really fascinating just personally is like, I think I was all, have always been grateful because from a young age I was really aware of I don't know I suppose the surreal chance that we have to be here you know 
And it became a very playful way of thinking for me, even though I was experiencing a lot of suffering, a lot of, you know, emotional abuse, a lot of, you know, narcissism and, and trauma and gaslighting and things like that. Um, even while withstanding those sort of, let's call them perennial betrayals that I was experiencing and trying to figure out how to deal with, I was still really motivated and this is what I've discovered the engine I think for my entire journey has been um, has been this level of relentless like insatiable curiosity mm -hmm. and I think that that curiosity is really what saved me because I began to get curious about the mind I began to get curious about the fact that as you learned more and as you looked inward and reflected that your consciousness, the texture of your consciousness would shift and change so slightly. And whenever that happens, then the way that you perceive the world changes. And whenever that happens, then the way that you change in the world. And I noticed that in a very granular level from a young age. And I think it made me, you know, obviously the, you know, the curiosity of wanting to know more and more and dig deeper, but I think it made me uh, grateful to to know that even though I was, you know, suffering, that there was a path forward, there was a way out. And um, so it's interesting, it's kind of a contradiction where I felt really frustrated and um, resentful for what I was going through. But at the same time, I felt really grateful for the fact that I had a, you know, a mind that happened to be able to be aware and, and, and kind of claw its way out and grit its way out of it. Yeah. I think in the journey of awareness, mindfulness, we have to be able to hold contradiction. Mm -hmm. we, we're holding light and dark, you know, um, we're holding life and death. And so we are, no matter where we are in our journey, maybe we're going to face some of these things. You named betrayal, perennial betrayal at that. What is a way that someone who feels betrayed can find the path through that? What did you find? Ultimately, it was recognizing what it was, the feeling, the emotion, the blockage, the repression internally, and then feeling more gratitude for the fact that that feeling that I lived with for a long time actually was helping me. It was there trying to protect me. Mm. And then being able to come to the present, see who I was today as opposed to who I was whenever I formed that feeling and being able to let it go. And I can walk us through this path. I think this could be, you know, in, yeah. in more detail, I think it could be useful for younger people listening. <laughs> I guess it's of any age, but, you know, <laughs> um, you know, it's, especially if you, you know, come from a background, you know, if we're talking about some sacred sons here, if you come from a background where you don't have a good support system. And that doesn't mean that you're, you know, a lot of people hear that and they think that means you're unloved. You know, that's not always the case. You know, I experience conditional love, but, you know, you can have a, a good, you know, family that's doing their best, that they're, you know, you're not experiencing trauma, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't mean that just because they, you know, they were providing for you, either financially or you know, emotionally in some cases, that they had the, the adequate toolkit to still show you the world in the way that you needed to thrive and to feel safe, to feel confident within yourself, and to feel like you had some clarity and also some, an ability to trust home base you know, the, as in yeah. your, your home and also the uncertainty of life and the unknown. And that, of course, gets into attachment theory and so on. Um, but, you know, for me, uh, oh, and I was going to say one other thing is that generally what that does is that forms a type of hyper independence. Mm -hmm. So whenever we're in a situation where whenever we're growing up and we feel like we aren't being shown the world, we realize that we have to be the ones to start doing that for ourselves. And while that becomes a kind of a superpower in a certain way, it also becomes something. It's like, you know, in a lot of, you know, superhero books, like comic books, their power also is like slowly killing them, you know? <laughs> and totally, so, and it's, totally. it's, that's the metaphor. I mean, that's they why hold that's the contrast the, of, of 
being human or non-human and holding the superpower. Totally, totally. And so it's like, that's why that metaphor, you know, <laughs> or analogy is in those books. It's like, they're talking about that part of human struggle, you know? Um, and so, yeah, so how this, you know, uh, worked for me is, um, you know, hyper intellectualizing my entire existence from a very young age is like everything wow. was in the mind using that as a, a defense system, a way to, um, you know, separate myself from other people ultimately so that I never felt vulnerable. And this would look like in life and being a teenager and in my, to my early twenties of being like really intellectually aggressive towards people of making like hyper, like very disgusting jokes and stuff all the time. Obviously that's a way to disarm someone and make them feel uncomfortable so that they feel exactly so that then yeah. you regain control. Yes. Um, you know, kind of intellectually berating someone with a bunch of information or analysis so that they feel, you know, inferior, and then you again, or inadequate, you, inadequate. So you take control and then again, that creates space so that you don't have any vulnerability. So, yeah, I mean, I did, you know, I wasn't like particular, I, yeah, I could be very sarcastic, of course. I wasn't really an asshole per se, but I was just very, I mean, I probably could be, but I was very, very, you know, tr constantly trying to intellectually dominate every every situation for that reason. Did you have a cynical outlook on the world at that during that time? Weirdly is that like, I just would describe myself as like a optimistic cynic. <laughs> no, it's kind of speaking of contradictions. <laughs> there it is again. <laughs> like everything is bullshit, but we can find some truth in there, I think, you know. Um and it, what's what's dangerous about these systems is that like uh, kind of these structures that emerge, I'm sure a lot of the people listening, a lot especially a lot of young men will resonate with what we're talking about here, is that like What's dangerous about those ways of, of operating the world is that they work. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the thing about them yeah. is that you can have that outlook and it works. And that's what, you know, uh, was became a longer term struggle for me because it was like I framed emotions as weakness a lot, you know. And of course, you know, we, we can look at that and we know Again, that was a part of the plan, the charade to really try and qualify the fact that because, you know, what I experienced when I was really young was anytime I showed an emotion, I would be threatened, you know, and so I had to learn to disconnect from ever showing my emotions. Mm. And so I, uh, the way to, instead of addressing that pain and going into that, I created the story that like, oh no, there it's weakness and that like intellectualism reigns supreme. And so, um, you know, eventually at a certain point I started realizing just through my, you know, the increase of my self-awareness, like kind of the game that I was playing and that I needed to start figuring out like how to, move forward because as i said operating the world in this kind of hyper intellectual low emotion um controlling way it works but it's not you're not being a full spectrum human and you're not i would say you're not free yes it's, it's oh, like there's sure. a lack there's a lack of freedom because of the constant intellectualization or or toiling that's happening Totally. And you never can connect with anyone. You're very isolated. Mm. Because if you're always in this space of analyzation and trying to kind of intellectualize everything, um, ultimately what you're doing is you're trying to stay in control of everything. And even if you're having fun and quotes and you're laughing and you have these friends, you know, and you have connections like that, what you're not doing is allowing yourself to be open on an emotional level where you can actually connect with someone. So you have the veneer, like the facade of connection through being like convivial or affable or, or whatever like that. You're like, oh, he's a charming guy. He's really smart and weird and thinks differently. How cool. It's like, yeah, great. Yeah. And that's all, that's all there so that I never have to open myself up and actually tell you what I'm feeling or thinking. It's a nice entertainment distraction. <laughs> isn't it <laughs> yeah but it's not yeah you're not tapping into the full spectrum of what it means to be alive what it means to be human 100%. and so do you have do you recall like a cracking open a time of vulnerability whether that was 
I would imagine it would be in relationship to other humans, you know, but yeah. was there a mo was there, was there an actual moment for you where you allowed yourself to go through a process like that? Yeah. And it, I think, you know, what really got me onto the right track was, you know, I, I met my wife whenever I was really young and, you know, she was very helpful in me getting more in touch with my emotional intelligence. Um, but you know, after working on it for a period of time, what I would do is, um, just start, trying to rebuild those pathways because as I mentioned, like having the situation where I had no, there was no, no, not even any tethers to the emotional self. You know, it was like, I couldn't tell what it was. Like I couldn't find the feelings, you know, inside because those I had had to you know shove that down so much. And so I started trying to rebuild those pathways, rebuild the connection to self and the practice I just kind of created that I started doing is I would kind of treat it like a glass of wine. Like whenever I would feel, you know, tension, which I came to realize was a a blocking, a holding down of, of that emotion, I would just go, okay, let me just like taste this and see what flavors I'm getting. Like, I'm not going to try and <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, okay, like I don't, I can't figure it out. I'm not going to try and figure it out. I'm just going to go, okay. I feel sadness. I feel fear. I feel uncomfortable. I feel like my sense of, you know, whatever, like, okay. And now that I can kind of label these little things, I have some breadcrumbs to sort of start attaching and getting more into a conversation with self. And so what, as I continue practicing that, what, you know, happened it was a, a, quite a beautiful experience, and this is the uh, I've the accordioning accordioning of what I was talking about at the beginning of this is, you know, I started just using a mindfulness practice and noticing every time I felt that tension, and I thought, okay, let me look and where is the tension? Where is it? it's in the stomach? All right. So next time, whenever I would feel that, I would sit down with it, and I would just look inward. And having kind of a, a, a lifetime of meditation is very valuable because having that access concentration, you know, the focus inward, the ability to navigate the inner landscape of self is really valuable because you can see clearly and kind of move around. And and so just looking inward, it's like, okay, well, there's that feeling of, of tension. What is, what's arising from that? And notice, oh, that's pain. It's like a lot of sadness. It's a lot of... Um, kind of self disgust in this weird way um like in a bill like in terms of an ability to be unlovable you know yeah. kind of listening to that voice of the inner critic come online yeah yeah and then looking even deeper i saw like oh that's betrayal and that's you know why i'm talking about this and i'm like yeah. oh, it's betrayal now what is that that's so interesting how do i feel the betrayal and i continued in this deep meditative state to to look at it and I thought, let me just find what's my first memory that I've connected to that emotion, that sense. And what it was, was being a little kid. And it was the first time that I expressed an emotion and having a parent turn around and threaten me for having expressed it. Like I was in trouble and I was bad for just express talking about the way I was feeling. And I connected this mem this kind of core memory of in that moment feeling like, wait, you were the one that was supposed to love me, to support me, to nurture me, to always be safe. And the first time I try and express that I'm unhappy, I am now being attacked. And that was like, I just tracked this earliest moment of feeling the, the when the, like literally when the conditional or when the unconditional love agreement was broken in my mind, and it was like, oh, here's the reality. Like, this is the truth is I'm dealing with conditional love and the people who I'm supposed to feel safe, I, I can't trust that. And emotions also must be hidden because if they aren't, you know, I'll get in trouble again and it'll take me further from love, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so whenever I, I saw that in this, you know, this memory, I then just looked at the, the feeling of tension and I thought, okay, like, thank you for trying to protect me because that's what it was in that moment. It was a shield, you know, of, it was a wall to protect from the, the injury of that moment that stayed with me for, you know, a few decades. I thought, okay, thank you for protecting me, but let's come to the present. Let's close the gap between 
the memory and the imprintations and the attachments of the past and what's actually happening in the present in reality. In reality, you know, I've grown into a strong, confident, independent, you know, man. And I don't need that protection anymore because I'm okay, I'm comfortable with that part of myself, with the people in my life, and I can let that go. And I've actually just visualized that, you know, tension leaving and exhausting the body and moving free and breaking apart. And um, whenever I did that, the connection to the emotional self began to rewire and reform. And I was able to access that place um, and really find balance and the, you know, very harsh intellectual part of myself with the part of myself that could deeply feel. Yeah. Do you consider yourself to be a loyal person as a result of this? Incredibly. Yeah. Like uh, those are my core values are yes. integrity, like unshakable integrity and loyalty. Yes. And see, that's just it. The way through in my estimation is to flip the script on that core wound and mm -hmm. to make it your superpower. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like Superman yes. was also, you know, he was left on a on a planet by his parents and wrapped in his blanket that became his, his cape. You know what I mean? And probably there's this part of his story where, you know, he felt that that being left behind. And that that's ultimately like the gold, the silver lining, the jewels that we get to take from these, you know, traumatic experiences is we get to learn the hard way. Mm -hmm. uh, we get to learn how we wish to operate in the world. And so it gets to inform us. And I, and I feel like there, that is an empowering kind of fact about what can happen when we give the presence to those core wounds. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's like they, it, it becomes a weird, um, yeah, like you said, a weird superpower, you know, um, I suppose the work is, being able to swing them back around, you know, to where they, <laughs> they, uh, you can, um, you can control them instead of letting them control you, you know? Yeah. If you were a superhero, who do you resonate with? Who do you mm. like out there? Uh, let's see. <laughs> I have to think about them. I, I mean, like Xavier is pretty cool. <laughs> I'm in my mind. I'm going Professor X, Professor X, Professor X. I'm looking at you like, dude, you're Professor X. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's pretty fitting. <laughs> right. Yeah. Whenever I was a kid, uh, whenever I was a teenager, a lot of my friends used to call me Yoda because mm. uh, <laughs> I would always, I mean, you know, cause I was studying this stuff just privately. And, and again, you know, um, I had to, to hide it, you know, in, in my house. And so, but I would always like try and talk about this stuff, even whenever I was, you know, in high school with people and, uh, yeah. they don't, you know, yeah, that's Dude, funny. what's cool about that is Professor X used to go into the machine. Shoot. I can't think of the name of it right off the top of my head. And he'd put the helmet on and he could tap into all of the mutants. He could tap into all of the suffering and the, you know, the way he would find them is almost through what we're talking about. He because these he's finding the the others, right? He's finding the other X Men out there, and he's tapping in through their pain. Mm -hmm. He's able to he's able to see them because they're they're out there. And so, in a way, with your writing, with the the work that you offer the world, you're kind of like putting on the the helmet and broadcasting to the collective through your own personal experience. I, I love that analogy, and also I like the notion of the helmet being the meditative state as well. You know, <laughs> yes, cerebral. I think that yeah. was the name of it, cerebro. Oh, cerebral. Was. <laughs> yeah, that was Amazing. the name of the machine that he went into. Amazing. Yeah, that's cool. All right, brave new you. It's out. How you're, you you said how you're feeling about it? Um, is there a connection for you? To Brave New World, obviously in the, the wordplay in the title, but is that a book that you grew up reading? Um, I have read it, um, but it was not featured. Uh, and I actually didn't consider that whenever I came up with this title. Okay. Uh, it wasn't a, an intentional play on words, it, but it did become a big discussion with my literary agent and publisher and some other PR people and, and so forth about 
some people loved it. Some people thought that it was not a great energy to bring to the message. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, what's funny is that I, I did a lot of thinking about about it. And, you know, this friend of mine who's a, a brilliant young guy, he's in his mid-20s, I asked him about it and he was like, I've never even heard of that book. And I was like, right, people under 40 probably right. <laughs> probably haven't ever even heard of it. Um, but interestingly, all things, you know, uh, nature is in, in the universe are all full of fun little whirly gigs and, uh, you know, yeah, wonder totally. winks and so forth. One of the reasons uh, why it became kind of astonishing to me after the fact is I didn't consider that when I came up with the title but through crumbing up with the content, one of the methods I did was like my social media and my writing generally reaches about a million people a week online. And so I was thinking like, if I pay really close attention, I'm fascinated to understand what it is that like the cultural mind is asking for right now. Yes. So I paid very close attention to the themes that did well that I wrote about, like how people commented, what DMs I got, what emails I got, what messages I got. And basically like I took a lot of notes for a long time just because I wanted to understand, like I know what I think it would be useful, but what are people actually asking for and what is the big problem that like we are facing right now? And so I did this weird sort of like, hive mind listening for a while and took notes and that's really how I came up with the sort of core elements of the book but if we think about that that's sort of a brave new you or a brave new world type of thing I was like yes. taking notes and studying the you know the the civilians yeah and it is um there's an element of brave new world that is about suppressing human emotion and there's a, there's a line from this book that always stays with me, which is, impulse arrested spills over, the floods are madness. Mm. And so what you are doing with mindful practice, mindfulness practice and, and with these meditations um, is unlocking some of the impulse, some of those, like, some of that knowingness, some of the curiosity, like allowing us to unlock it, to no longer suppress it. Um, but to unlock it and let it let it flow, let the energy continue to flow. Otherwise, otherwise the, we can we can delve into madness. And that's <laughs> that's what, right. There's an aspect of that that I see happening collectively. Oh, we definitely. are in a, we are in a mad world, and I love that it's called brave new you, not safe, not playing it small. <laughs> it's brave because this type of work, this type of meditation, where you go, it takes courage. Yeah. It takes willingness and it takes bravery. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think about bravery in terms of, you know, um, something a bit different than I think a lot of people do. You know, generally we think of it as something in the, you know, landscape that we have to face, that we have to walk towards something outside of us. You know, I think about it, you know, in the reverse of that. I think about are we brave enough? of that in the face of a world which is telling us how we should live, what beats we should be hitting in our lives, what we should find important. Can we be brave enough to just honor ourselves in this culture right now? And I think that's the key. You know, ultimately, if you can do that, it does seem scary. But what will happen is that's how you start building meaning. That's how you start building purpose. And that's how you start building a confidence that allows you to face the future with uh, a complete level of self-trust. Beautiful. Thinking about you, thinking about, let's, I'm going to stick with brave new you. A lot of this journey, I feel like, is not about adding on, like adding on new tools, new tips, new tricks, new memes. But it's a lot about like, accessing what's already there and undoing. Mm -hmm. Is that making sense? Like undoing some of the programming, some of the, um, some of the things that happen to us in a way to get, it's not to return to a sense of childlike wonder, but it's to embody it here and now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean most of everything in the, the journey, the path is undoing. It's taking away, you know, and that's what a lot of, I think it confuses people and can become frustrating is because we are taught that success is acquiring more. Right. You know, the, the 
the, the bigger the house, the more stuff you have, whatever, then the more your status, acquire more status. And you're building an external sense of worth where truly what we want is to remove as many things as we can, to remove our reactions, to remove our negative impulses, to remove our you know, misaligned senses of self, the way that we identify who we are and how we exist in the world and what we're capable of, to remove our assumptions, our expectations about reality, our assumptions of what will happen, of what could happen, and engage with the present moment as it is now so that we can see, you know, reality with a sense of clarity. Because only if we see reality with a sense of clarity do our actions that we take in life actually connect with, with the real world. And that's what I think becomes frustrating for people is that they don't engage with reality and so the, the actions that they take don't have an impact because they're not engaging with it, what's actually there. They're playing in this like sort of, you know, this fantasy world. But it's not until you really look clearly and you see what is can you really start, you know, making these moves that cause change. And, you know, like, ultimately, that's why I start off the book with what I call some mental house cleaning, you know, mm. it's like, let's start not here, here aren't these aren't tools of what to do. These are tools how to undo what you've been doing. You know, let's let's stop imposter syndrome. Let's learn how to deal with overthinking. Let's stop making assumptions about ourselves and other people. Let's stop feeling self-conscious for no reason. Let's just root all that shit out so that we can ultimately create the space so that we can begin to hear ourselves internally and then take intentional action in the present moment because that's where the change begins and that's where we can start building the self-connection, the self-trust, and the meaning that we're all looking for. Yeah. And the self-knowledge. Knowledge of self, I feel like it is of the utmost value in this earthly realm. Um, it's, it's a part of our design to really... I'm not really for self-mastery. You know, like I mm -hmm. get it. I, I, I know that that's like a thing that people are chasing as well, but it's really about self-knowledge. Whether I've mastered a thing or not is irrelevant. For me, it's like, do I understand why these emotions are coming up? Do I understand why my frustration is out in front in particular situations? Um, and yes, I could become a master in the ways of calming that fr frustration. But that, for me, that's not the point. The point is, is the knowingness. Yeah, I mean, just linguistically, the notion of self-mastery seems very limiting to me. Mm. It's like mastering it suggests that you will explore all aspects of self and have this educated sense of knowledge where you can deal with everything. But it's like, yeah, well, I'm going to break this to you, but like, we are perpetually expansive and there is there like and we will never stop changing because we're living you know organic beings that life is like filtering through us in every moment that we're awake and as that happens our sense of self is truly impermanent we're always changing so to the notion to like take a snapshot of a part of who you are and then master that to me just feels inflexible mm -hmm. uh, that's actually why i part ways with some stoic philosophies is it's like Stoic philosophy is a philosophy of repression in my eyes in a lot of cases. You know, yeah. and that's I think that something, you know, the Eastern wisdom traditions, particularly, you know, classical Buddhism, I think is really valuable because it it actually engages exactly what we're talking about. It's like one of the jewels of Buddhism is that it's you know, the the, the Dharma should evolve. It, Sure, it needs to evolve because everything is impermanent. Yeah, you know? change is the only constant. It's the law of the universe. Everything is is vibrating and expanding. Right, right. And so, Absolutely. yeah, to master it has a it has a, a a tone of dominance in there, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. There's, and that's one of the interesting you know things about it is that it brings the ego into you know into the picture. And and again, you know, we're we're getting back to my. 17 year old self would have loved that, <laughs> that, that idea if I was trying to intellectualize the world in that way, you know, right. <laughs> because you, yeah, you, 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 you create the illusion of self control in that way, you know, and it's, it can, like I said, it can work, but it, you won't get the full spectrum of human experience. Yeah. If, if self control is an illusion, uh, what is the re what is the reality? I mean, we're speaking to it already, the, the constant of change, but what is the reality of of our existence? Self-acceptance, man. 
Yes. It's like, you know, except looking deeply and like accepting what is and then taking actions, you know, then moving forward. Um, I spent a long time just working on that. Just like, let me accept what is more and more and more deeply without trying to apply a story to it, without trying to change it to suit my bias or something yeah. like that. Let me just get in there and really be present with that. And then you can start moving some foundational pieces around, you know? Yeah. Let's get some tools for acceptance. I mean, I'll just, I'll say here at Sacred Sons, we have core agreements. Acceptance is one of them. Uh, and not only self-acceptance, but non-judgment of others. When we create these sacred containers of men, uh, first we lead with confidentiality or courage because it does take confidence, courage to do this work and a knowingness of like what you share here will not be shared outside kind of thing. And then honesty. Once we're confidential, then we can be honest. And our third agreement is once we're being honest, can you find acceptance for whatever is being shared, whether that's your story, another man's story, in the ways of meditation and mindfulness practice, how can one come into self-acceptance? Someone who maybe, who let, let's talk about someone who's dealing with self-hatred coming into acceptance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are beautiful values, by the way. I think that's, that's really creates a, a brilliant container for people There's, to... I left it, the last two off, which are ownership and the sacred. So it's, mm. it's, it's a, it's a, an acronym for chaos, confidentiality, honesty, acceptance, ownership, and the sacred. And we open up every single one of our containers by having the men say, I, you know, like I agree to these, to these agreements while we're here together. And, um, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's incredibly important because it's not happening out there, out there. It's all judgment. Yeah. And I'm not talking about discernment. We, yes, we our discernment's got to be fully locked in and online. But the judgment of others in their authenticity, I think it's time to drop that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I wrote this thing one time, not to be a self-quoter, but um, <laughs> that, uh, you know, if only we could go a day talking to people instead of our idea of them. You know, because we have this projection, this sense of who people are and what they're feeling and what their story is and what their motivations are. And we also make judgments about, you know, their character, their value, etc. And that just shaves everyone down to 1% of the fullness of what they really are. And it makes you, it, it, you know, it, it, <laughs> that it also has a, an issue with, you know, people feel that judgment makes them, you know, better than other people they judge others so that they feel like if they diminish someone else then they raise themselves up in their own hypothetical hierarchy in their mind right. but really what you're doing is generating this a negativity and that negativity is like a poison that's just draining and filling inside of you the more that you perpetuate that way of thinking because the way of judgmental thinking when you diminish someone else it sh you know shifts the ultimately really the neuroplasticity of your mind, and so it shapes the fabric in which you begin to see reality and how you exist in the world. And so your world, if you focus and perpetuate judgment like that and diminishment, then that influences the way that you see everything, and that ultimately <laughs> puts you into this you know this uh, world in which is is filled and driven by that and. It becomes, you know, you become the very thing that you're um, using to uh, diminish others with. And it's just a really nasty, sad sort of path that is very, very common, you know. Um, I think that we could, you know, to your question earlier about how can someone learn to accept themselves, I think if we, you know, take what I just described and apply some of that generosity and generousness and gentleness to ourselves in the same way that we might do it to other people, it can be really, really uh, empowering, impactful. Because if we look at someone else and we go, you know, this person's an idiot, uh, I don't like them, they look stupid, whatever, um, then you perhaps using some mindful awareness, you could pause, you could look at them, you could say, you know what, I actually haven't really talked to them that much. Maybe 
maybe even the old if you spot it you got it situation is happening here something about them is is reflecting deeply into me and that's why it's sort of triggering me and i'm noticing you know myself a part of myself i don't like in them maybe i should approach this moment with curiosity and actually speak to them um naturally with an uh, an open mind and open awareness as opposed to approaching it with this level of assumption and judgment we can do that with other people and if we do that we're always surprised you know um we're always we'll always find more about the person you know people are these uh, infinitely deep wells of you know just of possibility of being of experience of thought of emotion and it's only up to us to be open enough to be able to see and receive that. Um, but we can take that same process that we might use on someone and we can turn around and use it ourselves. We can go, I, I am making these judgments about me. I'm making these judgments that I'm, you know, stupid or uh, unlovable or ugly or not confident, not powerful in my life. So I don't have not enough and not worthy. That's what mm -hmm. all all of those kind of things on the surface boil down to. Like I'm not worthy or I'm not I'm not lovable, right? Absolutely, yeah. And I like to go. Let's let's look at that, and then let's so say, like, where are the facts? What is it in this room? Point to it. Where is it? What's supporting that argument against you right now? It's like it's just not there. You know, it's not there. It's the it's the the story of the mind that's being held on to from probably you know twenty years ago that you're still allowing to influence you, and so giving yourself some of the same grace and spaciousness that you would give perhaps someone else. And that sounds weird, but like looking at yourself with an open mind. Right. You know, it's really valuable. And that's why, you know, one of the chapters or one of the parts in my book is called self uh, healing is self discovery. You know, that's really what it is. It's looking inward and beginning to accept the parts of us that are creating, you know, that, that are in pain, that are suffering, the, the parts of us that have a level of yearning for more, uh, any of this type of stuff. We have to explore that because we can't take action if we don't know what it is that we're working with. And so being able to really look at ourselves with an open mind, to slow down, to relax, to allow ourselves to see the good things, the negative things, you know, the challenges, um, our gifts, and mm -hmm. with clarity really will help us understand uh, and discover these elements of ourselves that we wouldn't have access to otherwise and it's through that process that we then learn you know what our path the next step in our path is going to be yeah i love the emphasis you're putting on curiosity as the tool like that's the tool to get uh acclimated with to get acquainted with right mm -hmm. because that self introspection self introspection it requires a curious mind and we were kind of, I was fed a line, curiosity killed the cat as if it was some type of bad thing to become curious, more curious even about others, especially when those feelings of judgment come up. It's like we were taught stranger danger. We were taught all these things of like, just like shutting people out instead of leaning in. Mm -hmm. And I find that curiosity to be so empowering in the ways that you're saying, because like we truly don't know. And I, you know, you don't know what someone's carrying, what someone's been through, um, even in the worst of situations, I just I, I think that that curiosity can cut through so much, um, and it can be absolutely healing. Not not, oh, something, yeah. to, not something that killed the cat. Something that he, <laughs> that's something that healed the cat. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is, man. I mean, it is. It's it's. I think it's been the through line for me for everything. Has been being just curious about my mind, being curious about you know, insight about wisdom, about, you know, the, the experience of meditation, curious about other people. And like, wherever you start, you know, exploring your own mind and looking inward, you see how expansive and rich it is. And then at a certain point you realize, oh, everyone's mind is like that. Wow. Like if I'm open enough and presence enough, I can begin to experience the deepness and richness of what everyone has to offer. And it's only through, if you get rid of and let go of your this, your assumptions, your story, like 
the the preferences in which you've identified for whatever culturally imposed reasons that you should be talking to like this person or not you just meet someone right where they are and like as a human being you'll find that everyone is like incredible <laughs> you know you just have to be open enough to be able to see it you know and, and there's something that we can resonate with in all life experience truly I've, yeah. I've done work with thousands of men at this point and it never ceases to amaze me just how um, just how much I can relate and just how much we in the circle it, something beautiful that happens is we, we bring one man in he shares he goes through some type of a process and I'll often say like how many of you guys resonate with what's being shared here no matter what the story is it's really like we, re- we resonate to the emotion Mm-hmm. of the experience more so than the story that we create or the meaning that we give it but we can resonate with the emotion and i find that to be incredibly again empowering and and like helpful helpful in the the process of in, of undoing because if i can see one of my brothers like letting go of this of this parental betrayal it's like maybe i can let go of a little bit of it too and that's yeah. just like a, it's a natural thing that happens uh and alternatively, I think it happens the other way, and that's how they play us. Mm-hmm. They go like, like, oh, well, let's let's condition these folks to hate each other, and then they'll get on that frequency. Oh, right? for and sure. That's, that's kind of what happens broadly. And so I want to bring bring us to another part of the book, chapter five, part five, an appetite for possible <laughs> things. I love this chapter title. Can you tell Thank me you. about about an appetite for possible things? Yeah, so that's a line that now that I did take from somewhere because <laughs> I I uh it's been in my mind for 20 years and I finally found the right place to use it. So Bertrand Russell for people that don't know was a mathematician, a philosopher, just a, a all-around genius um from the night you know kind of the 1920s ish era. And he wrote a book called The Conquest of Happiness. It was kind of the first self-help book, I guess. Um, but it's it's brilliant. And um, he addresses some really fundamental human things in there. And he's trying to understand what is it that makes a person happy. And one of the things he talks about in there is what he calls zest. So that's the word that he's used to describe the energy that kind of makes you feel alive, that gives you that extra, like whenever you feel lit up and like just you have that enthusiasm and that weird cosmic wave of wind like blowing at your back, you know, something that really just lights you up. And he talks about the importance of, of, and this is what I, I build on this model in, in that chapter, is paying attention for those things in your life, recognizing what gives you the, the quote unquote, the zest and makes you feel alive and then focusing on that and like really making it a part of your experience because what's going to happen is that once you start feeling that energy you will start you'll get into this process of um doing that more in in doing that you will start to have meaning and whatever the things are that you do that make you feel that sense of feeling you will start feeling meaning, and then over time, you'll look back at having the you know done this stuff over time. You'll start to feel a sense of purpose because you're like, oh yeah, well I'm doing this thing that's making me feel really good and and like really bringing me to life. Now that's like a part of me, and that's giving me purpose. And then through that, you begin to start feeling fulfillment because you're going because now you've identified there's something I like doing that ma- that lights me up. I've done it, it feels purposeful, and now I feel fulfilled because I'm getting something back. I'm growing because of this experience. And then what I like to tag on there is that that's where happiness actually arises, is it's the afterglow of that process. It's not something you acquire. It's sort of the the smoke that arises from going to that process. So yes, the the zest is the appetite for possible things. And by by focusing on the things that give you that extra kind of jolt of life, your desire for that increases more and more. And it makes it where you then 
start believing that more things are possible in life for you because you go through the the process of recognizing something that's meaningful that you enjoy doing it making it a part of your life becoming better at it improving your life because everything changes whenever you have the sense of meaning and fulfillment and excitement and direction in your life and then the next thing that you look at, it's not a mystery anymore. It's not a, you know, uh, ooh, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I could trust myself to go into the unknown. It is a, a desirable thing where you have this hunger, this appetite to go, oh, now let's go, like, let's make this happen because I know what the process is going to be like and it's going to make me feel even more alive and even more, you know, deep and rich and connected to my experience and on and on and on. That's been my experience as well. When I get that full body light up, that full yes, um, the more that that happens, the more I exercise that, uh, the more I come to seek it or to mm-hmm. look for it through experience. And it informs me of my nose as well, you know, because a lot of people um, might, in our society, we get confused because there's like, you know, there's things that might pay us, but they don't make us feel good. But it's like a, it's seen as a positive potentially or we're not really following that inner knowingness that intuition and we start to follow external things right mm-hmm. and so i love that that zest <laughs> the zest for life i didn't know that's where that came from and so what do you think is possible through this mindfulness through you know let's say let's say we get to a a place culturally um globally we're more connected now than ever you know are you doing all this in in any attempt to uplift you know broadly the consciousness or is it just for individuals to continue towing the status quo towing the line for Mm. politicians to make terrible decisions i mean where does this go for you as a as the inception of some of these ideas and teachings you know what would you like to see happen yeah, I mean, it's definitely, um, it is a, a a plan. It's a map that I want people of the world to follow so that they will feel the way that you and I are talking about. You know, whenever we talk about the work that we're doing, you know, being able to feel that, like, yes, I do have direction, I have clarity, I have value, and I can at least at the very least try to approach and achieve the thing I really want to do in my life. And I feel like that if more people are doing that and more people are living in that way, then that's going to, you know, generate more awareness, more happiness, more positive exuberance in life and culture. And if the life and culture has more of that, of course, the things that fall away are the judgments, the pointless toxicity that's out there, you know, all these negative aspects of society, um, the distraction even. It's like, well, let's, you know, if we all become focused on what is important to us, then the need for distraction starts to drift as well and starts to fall away, you know. Um, So I, I love, you know, the idea of all of those things being there and and helping people and helping them really go for what it is that they feel it because that's that's like where the premise the whole cusp of this came from is as i was brave new worlding and i was paying attention to what you know everyone was was talking about the thing that that was the most universal that really surprised me was that people talked about feeling an emotion of like, ah, I feel like I could make my life better. I feel like I want to do this. It's like right out of my reach, but I just can't figure out how to get from here to there. But I feel like a damn holding back all of this energy, but I just can't, I don't know where to start. I don't know how to do it. And that's why I chose this, this path, you know, to, to move through in the book is it's like, here's how you can, Stop thinking in a way that's going to hold you back and start listening to your intuitive, instinctive voice about what is meaningful to you, not other people. And then here's how to not only build the confidence to be able to approach those things in life that will really make your life blossom and meaningful, but also how to have the the maintenance to be able to sustain that and strengthen over a long period of your life. To maintain it. I love that you're giving a map. And so... I've gotten a, a bit of like what's possible 
What type of a world does that create? Let's now let's bring it back to that individual who doesn't know. Because I love to give the practical tools. Everybody has their own uh, experience of meditation and how difficult or easeful it is. One of my teachers, uh, shout out to Hawk Moon, he always says, if you can meditate on a crowded subway, like then you're a meditator. You know, then if I and for me in my life, I take that like if I can be present through my one of my children's tantrums, and not judge it, not fix it, just be present with whatever it is. That's when I'm really meditating, bro. Mm-hmm. That's when I'm like, yes, I'm here for this. Um, alternatively, when I go into frustration or or whatever else comes with me, I'm a generator, so my. Uh, my my thing my not self as they call it is is frustration so i reference right. that often but i can i can feel when i'm not in it when i'm not in that flow and when i allow myself to go into the to the alternative so like for the brothers and sisters who are out there and are like yo i've tried meditation i my mind is distracting me this is going on and you know those those typical stories come through what is step 1 how do we become um how do we allow meditation to be a useful practice for us and not something that we're doing wrong? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I could talk about this forever, but I think step one is like lower the stakes, lower the stakes and, and don't make assumptions about what it should be like, because there's so much, you know, flowing through kind of the cultural mind about like, Meditation will give you X, Y, and Z. Here's how you do this, this, and this. This is what it should be like. This is what you'll feel. And it's not really a successful way to describe meditation or what it should be because it's such a personal, unique, internal experience. And so it, it's kind of the same as like someone tells you, like, well, this is what happiness should feel like. Like, this is what happiness is. It's having a yacht and uh, whatever, uh, um, you know, a mansion on the cliffs of the Amalfi Coast. It's like, uh, that doesn't make me happy, but I guess that's a, what you're supposed to do. You know, that's the same type of thing. So simplify, approach it with an open mind. And I would say the 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 easier, the better. And then understanding that, it's a a process where the benefits fade in over time. A lot of people expect it to things to happen quickly, like you, you know, just flip a switch. This is something that fades in in your life. So, I would say anyone that struggles with it, first off, like I said, forget your, any of the expectations, any of that stuff. Approach it fresh and make it really basic. Sit down five minutes a day and just take a breath in. And as you exhale, relax the muscles in your body. Take another breath in. And when you exhale, relax the muscles in your body a little more. Just make it kind of a game where you're, with yourself where every time you exhale, you're just softening and softening. And if you need some stabilization in terms of like something to focus on, when you breathe in, you just in your mind, think the word rising. When you breathe out, think the word falling. And in between breaths, think the word sitting and just repeat that thought process. And you know that your mind will wander. You'll start thinking about dinner or whatever you were talking about earlier. And when you notice that, just bring it back to your your breath and focus on the rising and falling and sitting. And just do that for five minutes. And don't, again, extend the lack of assumption to to after the meditation is over. Don't expect to feel a certain way. Just do it. And then... The beautiful thing and the important thing about it is the compound interest that comes from meditation. So doing it even five times a week for five minutes, after one week, you'll start to notice a little bit of spaciousness in your daily life. What that could look like is you'll be speaking with someone and normally where you would react and say something on autopilot without thinking about it and then perhaps post-event process and later be like, ah, oh, damn, I wish I hadn't said that. You will notice it arising. You'll notice the, the impulse to say that thing as you're saying it. And you'll notice the spacious of mind to where you actually have control and intentionality in the present moment. And you can choose to not say that reactive thing. This is just an example. There's, of course, a lot of different ways that this shows up. But you'll begin to notice a, a 
deeper sense of awareness in the present, a more comfort and ease in the present so that you can live intentionally and make those choices consciously as opposed to just living in this momentum of reactions. Um, Another beautiful you know, reason why this will help you feel more calm meditation over time and the spaciousness is because most of us are living in fight or flight mode all the time. We're just constantly reacting to our environment. That's how we all grow up. We're not thinking about what we're doing. We're just reacting to what people are saying to us, what we're experiencing, what we're looking at online. We're emotionally and intellectually reacting. And then later we turn around and think about it. Um, what you know, our mind doesn't make a distinction between the context of what's happening outside of our bodies. It's paying attention to the language of our bodies. So if it is, if our bodies are tense, if we're anxious, if our breath is moving fast and we're cramped and, and, and moving quickly and looking around and, you know, like, Oh, I'm going to look at this. I'm going to look at this. I'm going to look at this. Our mind thinks that we're in a threatening situation. It's like, oh, the environment must be threatening because look at how the body is acting. So we stay in the sympathetic nervous system state, which is the fight or flight state. Through this meditation, even the five minutes a day, when you're breathing, what you're doing is you're breathing slowly and calmly. You're actually sending signals to your mind that your body is safe. So your mind now goes, okay, the body, it's relaxed. It's breathing calmly. That means that its environment must be safe. Let's switch over to the parasympathetic nervous system mode. Let's get over to this rest and digest zone where we can stop applying so much conscious energy to the world outside of us because we don't need to because there aren't threats. And we can apply that energy looking inward and understanding ourselves, what's happening inside of us and so forth. And the more that you meditate, even that simple five minute practice that I mentioned, over time, your nervous system will slowly start shifting from that fight or flight zone to the relaxation zone over time to where it will become your normal state of being. And it does, and that's the thing is like, you don't have to make your meditation complex. You don't have to follow any courses or do any programs. Just simple sitting and breathing and watching your breath is really all you need to do. Of course, you can go deeper into it, but to get the effect that I'm talking about, to build this mindful awareness, it's just simplicity and consistency over time. I love that. I love the, I love the, invitation slash challenge to, to five minutes a day. I want to implement that across all schools because our education system has largely like caused us to become reactionary. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so like, yeah, what, what does that look like? And then I think about some other cultural practices like you know, in Islam, they pray five times a day. Right. It's like, oh yeah, that's, I could see how that could be hugely beneficial. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. You know, as one moves through their day and to just take that intentional time. I also love how you're how you're saying it doesn't have to be any system that you can create your own. That's a that's a beautiful invitation for folks who are just getting into their their practice. Last piece, and then we'll wrap. You mentioned your wife as being kind of a catalyst in your life, and is she also a meditator? Do you guys uh, <laughs> do you meditate? Does it is it helpful relationally? I'm asking um, I'm asking for a friend. You know, like yeah. <laughs> what's a what's a beautiful way to bring meditation uh, into relationship and into primary relationship with with self and your primary partner? Yeah, um, she was until we met, which I don't know. What that, <laughs> I don't know what that says. <laughs> let's let's say she's just at ground zero all the time. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, she was until we met. Uh, I think that if you you know if you do bring that into a relationship, yeah, it could be beautiful and you know create. Again, just the spaciousness and the you know the presence together, um, but you know it's certainly not uh, not mandatory. I think that's one important thing to you know for people to understand is I've had a lot of young young guys ask me you know people I've mentored and coached 
they'll say, you know, like, oh, well, you know, I, I like this person, but like, they're not into meditation. They're not into the same type of music I'm into. Is that like a problem? I'm just like, why would that be a problem? Like, like that you're, the problem would be you seeing their preferences as a representation of their deeper selves, mm. you know? Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's another way of saying if somebody's like, oh, my partner's not doing the work. It's like, oh, it sounds like you have more work to do. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? right. Yeah. Yeah. You can, I mean, that's a, it's actually something I touched on in the book is that, um, you know, if you want people around you to change because you understand how much it can be beneficial to their lives, the best way to do that is by example. Mm. Change yourself because you can, you know, try and convert someone and tell them all about it. But it's literally like, you know, perceptually to us, if you're telling, you know, you're at Thanksgiving dinner and you're telling your family that could care less, like, oh, you should also try meditating. It's amazing. They're like, shut up. I don't care. You're basically, if you swap out the context, you're essentially being like, you guys should learn how to speak Icelandic. Like, it's amazing. You know, they're like, I don't care. Stop. Why are you talking about this? But if you practice yourself and they start observing the change and they're like, Oh wow, Adam seems a lot more like calm and like happy and chill and warm and fuzzy. I wonder what's up with that. And then they're like, Hey, what have you been like? You seem kind of, I don't know. You seem happier. Like what's up with that? And you're like, Oh, well, you know, meditation has been really helpful. And then they'll be like, really? Like what, what's, you know, how do you do that? Why? Like how, tell me about it. And that's how you can, you know, start to invite change into people's lives that kind of you might care about that, but yet they might not be aware of the benefits they're missing out on. Yeah. Invitations only, no forcing. <laughs> yeah. with, with, really with anything, uh, especially learning Icelandic, but like in the <laughs> the work, the self-improvement, um, which I believe all of this goes beyond the self, fully actualized. Mm. You know, this is not for, I don't, I don't, I don't believe the end is is in the self actualization i think i think there's more there that happens but invitations only no forcing i love that yeah what, a, what do you, what do you think the end is <sighs> it's not an end um it's not it's not like uh i don't think it's it's an ending but i do think there that we are like heading towards an age call it the golden age or whatever that is but i do think there's an age of awareness i think there is an age of families be being close once again i think there is an age of uh, returning to relationship both with self other with the, with the land um with with resources i think you know, I feel there's a opportunity that we have that it's like, if there is some amount of peace that you have felt or you have uh, obtained in your life, that we get to pass it on. And I don't think it's an end because I don't think, I think life is a bit of suffering. You know, life is painful. We come into this life, I've experienced four births for example, I don't think it's about nerfing the world so we don't feel pain, but I do think it is about when we feel that, that peace within, we get to transmute it. We get to like offer it as an yeah. offering, as, as another invitation for others and get into a generative cycle of, of creating more and more peace. I love that. You know, we're in a we're in a time of war. We're literally now, right now, there are multiple wars happening on this planet, and the majority of our collective humanity cannot understand why, at all. Mm -hmm. You know, and when I see the suffering that's happening in this world, I think we can do better, and I think we can do just a little bit better tomorrow, and that's all. That's all really I'm out here for. Even it starts with myself to be a little bit better for myself, and then I think that ultimately. Um, that will lead to us all being a little bit better and having a little bit more peace um, in this in this reality that that's challenging, and it should be challenging. I mean, it's it's a part of the design of uh, 
of what some some call the infinite game. But I love in this conversation, I heard you come out of the fi- the uh, finite games that maybe you play with yourself and in the mind and more tapping into that broader picture, more into the infinite game, into some of the some of the things that we've been disconnected from. Mm-hmm. And so ultimately, I think what is currently experienced as disconnection ends in connection. I certainly hope so. Yeah, I certainly hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, you know, it's it's interesting is that I'm hoping that everyone is learning a big lesson right now, you know, via internet, social media, and the, the disconnection that some of like, that that has caused with people. So right now we're in the midst of learning the lesson. I think we're just starting to come down on the other side of it just a tiny bit. And people yes. are, you know, realizing, as you were saying, that, um, you know, the, the disconnection is not a game that ends well, you know? <laughs> right, right. And how can we mitigate, you know, the incredible benefits of the technology that we have while also not suffering from, you know, the, the pitfalls, every single pitfall <laughs> that it has to offer, you know? Totally. I, I, see the, I see that play out even in my children. You know, there's a lot of talk about um, how social media, even reality television, for me it's kind of like, this. it's similar to pornography. It's like watching other people's lives and judging it and X, Y, Z. And I even see it in some of the children's programming. You know, like I'm, I get why people who develop this technology don't allow their kids to have it, don't allow mm-hmm. it in their homes because it, it is a mind-altering force. Yeah. And, and right. I'm talking about I'm talking about Ryan's world. I'm talking about like all those YouTube kids, like kids watching other kids play or unbox a package. What is that? <laughs> it's, it, it, it makes us feel worse and it disconnects us. And I can tell even in my children when they're watching something, experiencing something that's alivening them, that's giving them the zest. Yeah. All of that, all of that kind of like unreality stuff that we watch or consume yet it it further disconnects us and we have to as as the adults in the room we have to like acknowledge it take ownership of it and make the subtle shifts that are necessary 100 percent, man yeah 100 percent. it's like if you look at reddit or or like your instagram wire or, or your if you're on mushrooms or something then you're like what the what the fuck is this <laughs> like, <laughs> like what, am, what am i doing like this is tragic you know like yeah, why is watch, what <laughs> yeah watch, watch the super bowl on mushrooms you'll be like wait what is what is this in in like even like that i'm in the realm of men's work i'm like for the guys who are so obsessed with a sports team that it it, it, it controls their emotions yeah. win or lose it's so far outside of yourself it's like you'd be better off just go to the basketball court play a game of pickup go play a game of flag football you'll feel 10 times better win lose or draw by the yeah. way if you're on the field playing it's a very different experience than stand by watching and allowing that to impact your emotional state, our emotional state. Yeah, yeah, it's another, it, that is really bizarre. People that get that attached to it, where it's another form of repression and displacement, you know? It's like, yeah. it's like, you're, you, that's, I used to make this joke all the time about, <laughs> you know, whenever you hear, uh, someone that has like a, like a, I don't know, like a Mustang or a Challenger or something like that, one of these sort of, you know, lower tier, like, you know, uh, muscle cars. And they do have a real predilection towards stomping on the gas for no reason to like, well, for the, the reason is that they want to make the loud, you know, the loud uh, exhaust the sound. Rev, yeah. The rev, yeah. And I always think like, man, no matter how loud that rev is, you'll never be able to snuff out the sound of your father's voice in your head. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious <laughs> to snuff out the voice in your father's head. You'll never, it, it won't be enough because it'll be the next car, the next most expensive or fastest thing. That's right. He's always going to be yelling at you, telling you you're, you're soft and that you can't do it. And you're trying, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Freudianly make, get the, uh, something tougher and louder and meaner to, to cover that voice up. But you just got to address it, man. <laughs> wow. You have to go inward that is the medicine that is that is the magic that you are bringing through Corey. um bro tomorrow 
big day. Blessings to Brave New You. Blessings, I, I imagine, the process of uh, writing. Is this your third book that you're putting no, out? No, second, yeah. This second. is your second book, so... Yeah. Um, it's the comeback. It's the sophomore album. Here we go. Right. You know, <laughs> and, but right. I imagine that's also been a, uh, maybe like a letting go process for you, you know? So just like, um, giving you the encouragement and we're going to broadcast this to all the sacred sons, go out there and get brave new you. I'm sure it's going to be a New York times bestseller. Let's get it up there. Sacred yeah. sons with that. Corey Allen, is there any final message words, poem, or a self-quote that you would like to leave with the <laughs> brothers and sisters who are listening? Yeah, I mean, I really just thank you. You know, I appreciate this conversation and you, you know, creating the space to, to have it and to be here and to, you know, just share some of, uh, yeah, what both of us have experienced in life to try and, you know, see if it might be useful to others. You know, I think about this stuff as map sharing. It's like we are going through life, cutting through the, the brush, drawing lines on the map, you know, and if we can uh, share that map, copy it with people who are on an earlier part of their journey, they'll get through the terrain a little bit faster than we did, you know, Absolutely. and that's what I look at this as. So thank you for uh, making that possible, man. I really appreciate it. And Corey, if, if uh, brothers and sisters want to listen to more of that sultry voice, <laughs> where can they, what's the, the name of the podcast? Yeah, here's my phone number. No, uh, <laughs> uh, podcast is, it's called, uh, and then it hit me. It, it was previously mm. called The Astro Hustle <laughs> way back in, in the day, but uh, now it's called, and then it hit me. Hear more from Corey on, and then it hit me until then. Brother, I would love to. I'd love to connect further. We'll see what the stars have aligned for us. But um, you know, we have we have gatherings in Texas. We're all we're all over the place, and we bring in speakers and Beautiful. and the like. You know, just to to keep sprinkling, continue making those invitations. So, you know, we'll see, we'll see what is to come. Until then, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for using um, not only your gifts but also some of the sources. From your own pain to transmute that into this knowledge into this information uh, and into these invitations for all of us it's very much appreciated thank you man poison and medicine all in one with that Corey allen brave new you adam jackson sacred sons we're out family peace